All right, so welcome back. This is the Rapid Learning Interview Series for the love of Whitewater. And today we've got Alden Lee. He's going to be talking about his lifestyle and his kayaking experiences over the years. He was a former Rapid Learning member slash employee for a while. He works in our summer staff and uh, excited to have you on. Tell us uh, kind of where you're at right now and what life's like. Right now I'm in college. I go to Warren Wilson College in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I major in psychology. Um, I'm just trying to get out as much as possible, um, go paddling, go mountain biking, and just kind of be out in the outdoors. Uh, yeah, and f as for college, I'm, I'm trying to come away from here with um, a psychology degree that will possibly get me into grad school for, for therapy or something like that. We'll see. Future's uncertain, though. Yeah, awesome, man. That's a good school to be at, I guess, for the outdoors. You're right there in the Mecca. I mean, this, for so... Sure. Which town are you in? Which Where's Warren Wilson at in relativity to Asheville? Yeah, it's in Swannanoa. Okay. Um, yeah, just a little bit east of Asheville. So how did you get introduced to whitewater kayaking and what brought that into your life? I'm, yeah. I'm curious. Yeah, so I've always been, I've always been in the outdoors. Um, my parents, especially my mom, she would always just take me hiking and stuff. Um, I grew up on the south side of Atlanta, Georgia, and so we live kind of near like Stone Mountain, if you're familiar with Stone oh, Mountain. Yeah. I remember yeah. Stone Mountain. Yeah, and this, uh, this national preserve called Arabia Mountain, that's amazing. Um, we live pretty close to there, and so I just grow up kind of taking my dogs on hikes there. Um, my mom was always kind of trying to figure out like, uh, I guess just fun things to do in the outdoors uh, to keep me involved in the outdoors. And I really took to the outdoors just from hiking. Um, and so she took me whitewater rafting for my 15th birthday um, on the Ocoee. And, and I loved it. It was a fantastic time. I had a blast. Uh, I just loved being out on the river. And so for my 16th birthday, I asked her if I could learn how to whitewater kayak. If you could, if you could give me a whitewater kayaking class. She looked online and saw the NOC. Um, and so I, I was able to do a half, half day program with the NOC uh, paddling on, on Lake Fontana. Yeah. And, um, that started it off. I loved it. How many sessions with them did you do? And then how did you transition to finding rapid learning? How did that all kind of come to fruition? Yeah, so with the NOC, I did one session. It was, it was fantastic teaching. Yeah. Um, and everybody was super friendly, but it was $150 for half a day to go out there, you know? And so it was kind of like a, like, boom, this is your, like your birthday present. This is what we can do. Yeah. Uh, but afterwards I was just like, this is amazing. Like, this is, this is what I want to do. Like, this is, yeah. I love this, you know? Like I wanted, I just, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it and like being up on a river in the mountains, you know, just like the setting of that and the feeling. Um, and I mean, obviously we couldn't go through the NOC anymore though. It's just too expensive. And one oh, of the, man, it is. yeah. And one of the amazing things about outdoor Chattanooga is that you guys offer a whitewater kayaking program that is financially reasonable. And it also, it makes it accessible for a lot of different people. Um, I mean, the, like $10 for rapid learning, even coming up from Atlanta, is like, you know, we can make a day trip out of it and all and like go see a new city and and the biggest that is gonna be is gas money because it's, it's ten dollars to go to roll practice. It just made it to where I could actually whitewater kayak, you know, and y'all provided the gear, um, which was amazing in the beginning and stuff too. And so I was able to actually uh, give it a shot. And so through outdoor Chattanooga, learned how to whitewater kayak and fell deeper and deeper in love with it. Nice. Yeah, man. It, and going back to what you said about the price for NOC, just doing one class, $150. I mean, yeah. For your everyday person, that's a lot of money. And it's just, that's a huge um, obstacle in the way of probably allowing anybody to try, you know, whitewater kayaking. If they're like, oh man, I got to spend a hundred something dollars just to try it, not to have the gear, not to have right you know, all the things that come with that but just one session mm -hmm. so expensive 
And, you know, I think that's one of the barriers in this conversation that we'll keep, we'll, we'll keep talking about it, but that's one of the barriers that keeps a lot of people from being able to enter the sport of kayaking and a lot of outdoor sports in general that you have to buy gear for. So, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, the rapid learning program is cheap. You know, you get great instruction, you have professionally trained instructors and you have people that have experience and you have all the gear that you need. So it's, just, it's like the perfect prerequisite to figuring out if it's for you and then building off all that experience that you yeah. have. Yeah, I agree, man. Um, yeah, and Outdoor Chattanooga is also, uh, I, I think that like being able to go there and, and starting with the role class and stuff, um, I, somebody helps you fit a boat and like gets you in a boat, you know, and teaches you the basics and stuff, but it, it's much more, uh, I, just, I think that the feel of the role class of Outdoor Chattanooga is a, is a much more like welcoming kind of just like looser, more laid back, comfortable vibe to learn how to whitewater kayak rather than, I remember we got on the lake and then we just instantly started paddling around like in circles and like, you know, it was, it was the ratio is like one to eight people. Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, there's a lot of different instructors in the water with outdoor Chattanooga, like kind of being able to, you know, work with people on a more individual level. It might be like one to three rather, you know, and you only pay, you, you pay $10 or, you know, something like that to, to have that, which is a better experience. So it's, yeah, yeah. outdoor Chattanooga is great yeah. for that. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that and I'm biased. You obviously know if I'm working there, but <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I've been very thankful to be working there and, uh, I, I, I really want to see more organizations like Outdoor Chat in cities like Atlanta, mm -hmm. cities all over our country for that matter. And we get a lot of, um, a lot of people come up and they want to figure out how this all came about, how Outdoor Chattanooga came about, um, and how, how we wrote our story because they want to start the same thing in their own city. And yeah and have that resource to, to give back to people that may not have the means to afford what we love doing. So, man, it's, yeah, it's, it's really special for sure. And I could go on and on for days about this, but we'll keep going here. So in today's topic in particular, um, we're going to be talking about racial diversity of the sport. So, you know, we thought you'd be a great candidate for that, considering that you had spent two years at Outdoor Chattanooga, you'd kind of seen, um, you know, what we focus on and how we want to offer outdoor stuff to everybody in Chattanooga. Um, mm -hmm. Not just your REI going outdoor enthusiasts, but like the people that would never get the opportunity to touch an outdoor piece of gear or to get in a kayak or any of that stuff. So we're just hoping that we can um, kind of bridge that gap more and more and more. So to kick this thing off, like how did you you, did, you grew up in the outdoors, sort of, right? Like you, you were yeah. hiking, biking when you were a little kid, stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I grew up going on hikes, you know, with my parents, stuff like that. We'd travel up to the mountains when we can, or we'd go down south to southern Georgia, just random places like that. I also grew up in a neighborhood with woods in it. So, I mean, every I would go out in my friend's backyard and we build dirt ramps, you know, and like jump bikes on the dirt ramps. And yeah. Go explore like, yeah, like the woods down by the lake in our neighborhood, just random stuff like, so I was always outside. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, I think that's, it's so critical too. Like, I mean, you may, you may have never found whitewater if you hadn't had that like foundation of being able absolutely. to get in the woods. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, uh, one of the biggest barriers definitely for whitewater kayaking is that um, just your background and the environment that you're raised in dictates mm -hmm. your relationship with the outdoors. I think so Absolutely. much. Yeah. If you, if you're, if you're born and raised in an environment where the outdoors is kind of like a norm and like an innately comfortable thing, just because that's where you're from, that's what you were taught to do from whenever, when you were like a little young and then yeah, it's much more easier to be like, okay, you know, whitewater kayaking is a, um, or any like, you know, sport, outdoor recreation sport, um, for that matter. Like, yeah, like you, there's a very visible like step to that mm -hmm. rather than I think, you know, somebody raised like in the inner city or just from a background where their, their family doesn't really get outdoors and mm -hmm. stuff. 
um, for whatever reason. On a more fundamental level of like what it provides, I think that everyone can see that, you know, it's, it's therapeutic to be in nature and, you know, getting into the less talked about subject of just adversity in nature, you know, is like, it challenges people on a, on a basic level of how they deal with stress and someone who doesn't deal with stress well, that grew up in a city and that's kind of foreign to them. They just, they're resistant to that change. They're resistant to seeing all of these other benefits that you can get from it because they're like, Oh, I don't like the mosquitoes and I don't like the birds chirping or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They're just like, Oh, that's too much. I just don't like it. Um, you know, that, I feel like that sometimes will kind of push people back too, because they think, oh yeah, I'm just going to go on a nice little hike and there's not going to be any stress at all. And then they find that there are some adversities that they're going to face and there's going to be some challenges. And I think that goes along with building that character and that appreciation for what nature allows, because it does help you to have a good base of dealing with stress, of challenge, of adversity, and then also seeking out those beautiful places that you get to get rewarded with after that hike of sweating and carrying your oh, food yeah. and water all the way up to a beautiful point and looking out into, you know, oh, yeah. miles of, you know, wilderness and mountains, especially in Asheville, you get to see just amazing yeah. places. So. Yeah. For somebody that doesn't have that experience, they probably do think, I mean, they might even, you know, think that like, I mean, the whole reason why I would go into nature is because it's supposed to be so peaceful and an escape. Like, you know, like it's all, it's all of that just lies because there is like these discomforts, you know, I could potentially get lost, um, different things like that. So I, I definitely think there is kind of, you know, misconceptions and stuff about being outdoors if you, if you don't come from a place um, where you're already kind of, where you already know know what it's like to be out there. Uh, but I don't think that that, I mean, I certainly think that that can be overcame and all, just if you, oh, absolutely. yeah. And, and especially if it's presented in the right, you know, if it's presented correctly and stuff, uh, especially when like dealing with somebody that isn't super familiar with the outdoors, like kind of like helping them view it through that lens of just like, you know, but, you are going to accomplish something today. You are going to like overcome adversity. It's going to feel amazing. Um, everything out here is completely natural. There yeah. isn't any, you know, like, I don't, I don't think that there's like, you know, such thing as like foul play or anything in nature. It's all nature's pure. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so like, you will be just completely surrounded today with the natural world and, and, um, overcoming adversity and stuff like that through this through this kind of like you know pure canvas like you don't have to worry about somebody like rear-ending you or yeah. whatever or like getting a getting a parking ticket or like yeah you know somebody like cursing you out because they have a bad day or something like that like today we'll go into nature um and we'll just be out here the mosquitoes and all you know we'll yeah. just we'll just be um, so I think that presenting, you know, kind of like that lens and helping somebody like see in that lens that's not super familiar with it, they can kind of be like, okay, like, I get that, you know, like, it's, it's, it might yeah. not all be easy, but it's, but it's an escape, you know, from, yeah. from like, the, yeah, from society, from different things, you know, it's healing, even though there is, it's not perfect, or, you know, doesn't even need to be perfect. Yeah yeah and it's different for everybody and I agree with you like the preparation and having someone who does have the guidance to kind of help you um just prepare better in general to have the right things before you start that trip and not just a guy you know like I said for hiking you know having the bug repellent having some sunscreen having plenty of water having all the snacks you need all those things go into making that experience much better so what impact has it had on your life? Obviously you've stayed in the outdoors since you were a little kid. You still do all kinds of outdoor stuff. Is it guiding? Is that a, it's a huge part of your life, I guess. And um, how would you say that it shaped you as an individual today? Yeah. Um, being outdoors or whitewater kayaking? Being outdoors. Being, being outdoors, outdoors in general. Yeah, man. I, I mean, it's, it's dictated most of my life. Um, it, it got me out of Atlanta 
dictated where I went to school, just the setting that I put myself in now um, after graduating high school. It, it is kind of like a, a primary thing that I think about when I want to, like what I want to do next and stuff like that. I mean, one of the biggest things that I uh, want in life is to live in a place that has access to mountain biking, kayaking, hiking, stuff like that, being surrounded by nature is very much an essential part of my life. I, I've chosen to live my life, you know, as connected as I possibly can to nature, to where it's, it's always there. Um, even when I'm in Atlanta, go on runs, stuff like that, trail running and all through the woods. I, I gotta have it. I found that if I, if I don't have the woods as a part of my weekly life, then I'm gonna, uh, things aren't gonna be so good. <laughs> it's essential to me. It's essential to, to what I wanna do. It's where I have like the most clarity and, and the most enjoyment and stuff yeah. for me. Yeah. I couldn't agree more, man. I, I would say the same about myself. Um, we do have amazing nature landscapes and wilderness areas. And the coolest oh, yeah. part about it really is that it's so close, you know, like you yeah. can live that city life and, and work that everyday job in the city and then escape the city and not drive that far, drive 10 minutes. Yeah and you're at a trailhead, at a really beautiful place. And, you know, we take that for granted a lot. So we're very lucky. For Chattanooga sure is a special city. Chattanooga is a real special city for that stuff. It for definitely sure. is. Yeah, yeah. we're very lucky. Um, so getting back into kayaking real quick, what do you think has been your biggest challenge in the sport and why in, this, in the sport of kayaking? Yeah. So the biggest challenge um, for new people getting in or just, or in general, like the your, biggest- Your personal biggest challenge. What, oh, what was your biggest challenge in the sport for you? Yeah. The mind game, for sure. Just, uh, yep. just it is, yeah. Whitewater kayaking is a super unique sport. And just, I mean, at, at every corner, you are having to break down mental barriers and like, and, and, and go against your intuition of like what you should do in this circumstance, you know, yeah. um, especially when you're first learning how to kayak. It's uh, my biggest challenge definitely was just kind of learning how to, how to conquer my fear mm -hmm. and, um, and think, and in times of like a lot of stress um, and a lot of just stimulus of just like, you know, like being amped up and super scared in a situation to learn how to think about it a lot more objectively and rationally rather than just completely letting fear control it. Um, and that's something that whitewater, I mean, whitewater kayaking completely changed my life in terms of that. Cause I, I didn't even mean to, but I carried that way of thinking throughout the rest of my life. And mm. I learned how to think more objectively and less controlled by fear mm. by paddling like the North chick or doing the Chioa for the first time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, or like even even paddling the Akoi for the first time. Like it taught me how to, because I mean, you know, I obviously survived and I like went down and I, and, and especially like doing the moves correctly for, for the first time. It's like, wow, I literally was up at the top of that rap, river, rapid, excuse me, paralyzed with fear, but I trusted myself and I saw the line and I, and I believed in what I could do. Like, you know, I trusted my abilities. Deep down, I knew I could do it and I made it through. Um, and so that, yeah, that was, a, that was an insane lesson to learn through whitewater kayaking. Like, like I did not think I could just do that. Just then. like, I yeah. had not, like <laughs> everything was telling me to like, get out of my boat and, and go away. But, but I did it. And like, I, I just trusted, you know, that I could see the line and that I had the ability and it worked out. And so, yeah, that was a, that was a really big lesson for me. Also the hardest lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I feel like everybody deals with that when getting into the sport um, on a lot of different levels and that those levels keep compounding. Like it, the first level being like just getting comfortable with class one, two whitewater and being okay with flowing down a river where you're kind of trying to be one with where the river is taking with you, not always taking you, not always fighting the current, but trying to use the current to guide you down the river. 
And a lot yeah. of people fight the current. They want to try and control it and conquer it. And there is a piece of that, but there's also a huge piece in flowing with it and using the river to take you where you want it to go. And, um, you know, I think those levels kind of get bigger and bigger as you progress in the difficulty of white water. The, the better you get, the more comfortable you get, the more confident you get, the more you're willing to let that warrior spirit and that intuition take hold and make good choices and run big stuff sometimes. I mean, it's just everybody deals with that on different levels when getting into the sport. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it is, I definitely agree with you that more times than not, uh, you do have to just go with the river. You know, you, you can't, you can't fight the river. You can't fight. You cannot fight the river. It's not going to work, you know, to, to battle it. And even the fact of, I mean, just, you know, basic, basic, like, peeling out and stuff you you have to lean with the river you know exactly yes. what you don't want to do you don't you don't think that you should you know like lean toward the way that the water is going but that's how you you do the move you know you have to completely almost just like submit to just like this natural movement it's a great way to really learn how to deal with you know control in your life and some things you control some things you can't control and it's like People look at the risk that you're taking in whitewater and say, why would you take those risks? Well, you're getting in a car every day and driving down the interstate going 70 miles an hour. There's risk everywhere in life. And yeah. I feel like when you're, you know, when you're whitewater kayaking, you're learning how to be okay with being in that flow state and being one with the river mm -hmm. and letting the river guide you sometimes instead of you trying to guide it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in the moment, in the, in the times that you start thinking that you can guide it and can control it and you keep taking these crazy dangerous risks, eventually the river says, okay, it's time for me to put you in your place and right. humble you. And sometimes that can be really grim and other times it can just be a good experience for you to learn, okay, I'm not always in control. And that really talks about your everyday life. You're not always in control. You have no um, control over your destiny. You can try your best, but there's a lot of things that happen to people that are really unfortunate. So I feel like yeah. that, that is what I learned from river, from the river all the time is that don't take life for granted, live every day to your fullest and enjoy the moment, enjoy that flow state that it provides when you're on it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think whitewater kayaking is interesting. It's like, it's a very, because you're right, there is so much risk, especially when you get into, you know, the higher classes and stuff, class five, like it, there's, there is so much risk there that, um, that it is almost like a, I think that there's a misconception with whitewater kayaking that it's, you know, just a daredevil sport or just pure adrenaline junkie sport when yeah. really, yeah. And when really, I mean, even like doing just the huge like class five runs and stuff like it's it's almost um meditative like there's like a like a sacred element to it or, or you know for lack of a better word um just in the fact that you are like confronting so much risk and danger and fear and the way that you get through that danger is not by just like just powering through like all of this adversity and stuff it's it's with like respecting the river respecting that power and and going with it and like read like seeing how how you can most um cleanly and logically like make it down a certain rapid uh, and just like going with it you know and letting go it's like it's it's very meditative i guess in a way like you know doing it yeah it is and i think yeah, that's, that's exactly right. A lot of pro kayakers talk about that, that being in this Zen state, you know, having um, that sense of Zen, that comfortability with risk, that knowing of yourself, that confidence in your own abilities and whether or not you want to put those up to the, to the task of challenging something so powerful, such as whitewater. And, you know, especially when you get up class five, you better be in the most, you know, confident, comfortable state that you can be to take those risks required with a class five river and make right. it down safely. And then yeah. there's a lot of times, you know, people see these pictures, they're like, I see the cool picture of you running a big waterfall, but then they didn't see the picture of you walking another drop 
you know, 50 yards downstream walking around it because something just told you deep down, ah, that's not for me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not running that one today. Like, yeah. you know, it's a lot of just, you know, being very introspective about yourself on the river, how you're feeling, and using those feelings to make good judgments, you know? Yeah. And I feel like that's, that's, that goes into everyday life too, man, using your own emotions to, you know, make good decisions in life with the people you interact with, with your job, with all those, all those things. So it, it really helps me with making good judgments in everyday life because when you are confronted with those intense risks and you know the the most um, fearful challenges sometimes that come from whitewater, when I get back into everyday life, the most like what what normal people would get stressed about, I don't get stressed about. I can just right. I um, last semester I had the opportunity to interview um, Chris Grotmus for a oh, research. Really? Yeah, yeah, for a research paper I did. Um, and one of the things he said he learned from whitewater kayaking was, and that he continues to learn from it, is uh, it really helped him become a, a super uh, efficient, critical thinker. Um, and I think that kind of like goes into what you're talking about with like the high stress scenarios, stuff like that, and how that can like transfer into your daily life. Like he says that he uses uh, like the critical thinking that he learned from like whether he should do giant drops like the Soto or whatever. Um, and like the thinking that he, he has behind like the process of getting to a drop like that and like executing it, he, he employs that and um, he's a real estate agent now. And so like when he's dealing with like homeowners and stuff like that, he uses that same like critical thinking and that same like stress management to uh, help with that. So it, it definitely transfers. Uh, yeah yeah into different life skills and it, I, I think i mean whitewater kayaking has only positively impacted the rest of like the other parts of my life yeah same for me man same for me um so to get into the community aspect of whitewater kayaking um what's your opinion of racial diversity in the sport of whitewater kayaking yeah for what i've seen i mean it's definitely it's definitely like a predominantly white sport it is. Yeah. Sure. Um, no, I mean, like, that doesn't mean that there is just completely no diversity at all. I mean, I've definitely seen uh, minorities out on the river. Um, but yeah, cer certainly a white dominated sport. Um, I, I, I think that that's probably slowly changing. Um, but yeah, from my experience, it's, it's predominantly white. Um, I've never experienced any discrimination in the sport, which is amazing. Um, and I, and the, the culture is certainly, I feel like from my experience, the culture of whitewater kayaking is not, uh, made me even really fully just recognize like, okay, I might be the only person of color, like on this whole river right now. Like I, I've never really thought about it in that way. It's, it's not a, it's, it's not a, a culture that kind of, you know, makes you makes that really be amplified in any way mm -hmm. at the same time well that's wow that's that's a really good um a good thing i guess that you feel that way i mean this is coming from your own you know experience and i'm sure it can be different but it's good to know that it doesn't feel like there's any kind of um discrimination any kind of judgments or any kind of um you know weird looks you know, right. I know this, you know, I know so I've heard different experiences from black people saying they feel like they're, they are, they feel immediately like they're the minority when they come to the outdoors sometimes, like there's just so many white people or, you know, yeah. so many more of other um, race groups that they feel like the minority as soon as they get into it. But it's good to know that you didn't feel, you don't feel that way from your experience in the sport and the community itself. That's cool. Certainly. But yeah, that, that definitely um, is a thing, though, I, I think. And I think that that it is a, a, a common thought and stuff that just, uh, I mean, the outdoors is, is historically white um, in context of, I think, you know, like outdoor recreation in America. And, um, and I think that that definitely kind of like lends into 
people of color thinking um, just, I don't know, like, you know, I, I might be the only black person out there or, you know, um, and I'm, and so, and like, that might, that, and especially like, you know, somebody kind of like not having like that background in the outdoors. Um, I definitely see, and I've definitely seen with like some of my friends and stuff like um, that, you know, kind of thinking just like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, uh, if I want to go out there and like, you know, feel so alone, like there's not just that comfort of uh, mm. having somebody that looks like you or, my, or having somebody that might be from a similar background, you know, to where it's like, like, yeah, I get it. Like you didn't grow up in the outdoors. Like, you know, like I get how this, how this feels and stuff like that. Like, you know, they might feel a little bit isolated mm. out there. Definitely well, the reality. Yeah, yeah, I, I can get that for sure. And this kind of goes into, you know, that question on barriers, misconceptions that particularly black people feel about the sport and maybe just about the outdoors in general. We know it's, it's um, generalized as an outdoor thing, not necessarily just a whitewater kayaking thing, but specifically it's a whitewater kayaking. What, what, what have you seen and heard as far as like barriers that black people or Latino people feel towards the sport? Like what kind of barriers or misconceptions do you think there are other than just, like we talked about earlier, obviously the background, your conditioning, your lifestyle, what's it, if you grew up in a city, didn't have access to the outdoors, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions um, is that it is just like a completely just daredevil, like risking yeah. your life all the time sport yeah yeah um, and that yeah and and that it's i think that just the element of just rapids fast moving powerful water you being on that um for a lot of people that's a foreign idea mm -hmm. to like you steer you steer far away from water moving quickly like that yeah. and that is just like ingrained deep inside of them yeah um so i think that that definitely uh plays a role for uh yeah for people of color um just people in general but uh and then and then a lack of diversity mm -hmm. certainly i think that um i think that a lot of people that would even possibly be interested in whitewater kayaking sometimes they're turned off by like i mean even just looking up like where to go whitewater kayaking at um it's $150 for half a day, you know? And yeah. so, yeah. And so it's just kind of like, that's a little bit too much. Um, not quite sure if I can pull that off. Um, yeah. And so I think that those are some of the different elements of it. Yeah, I agree. Those are definitely some of the elements of it for sure. Um, I really, you know, I guess this kind of, gets into you know how how can we bridge these gaps how can we break down these misconceptions these barriers for um just people of color in general what going forward i know outdoor chattanooga has tried to kind of make your make its own staple make its own stamp um and trying to change that tide trying to start a new evolution of opportunity for people of color to get into the outdoors like what yeah what, where do you see it going you know what what things do you think we can do as an outdoor community to give more opportunity to everybody yeah i think that some of the best ways to get a more diverse population into um the sport is through just kind of like community outreach um and, and through having people from communities where whitewater kayaking might not be as, uh, uh, I mean, as popular, you know, as much education about it there, like people from those communities kind of like maybe exploring it, you know, and then coming back and like saying like, you know, like, hey, this is actually what it's about, um, different things like that. Um, rather than you know so that there's like a conversation about it uh with two people you know that are comfortable with each other and stuff if that makes sense yeah yeah it does um 
this has kind of always been on my mind and just something I've wanted to put on my plate. That was kind of why this interview series came to um, came to fruition, man, is I really wanted to keep opening this dialogue. And right now it's only going to be on, you know, Facebook primarily. And we're going to try to um, get it to reach other audiences, but it'll be prim primarily through the rapid learning platform. And we're wanting, you know, that audience to hear these conversations. But then we hope, the hope is that people hear these conversations and tell a friend and say, you know, I, I've known about rapid learning and maybe, maybe they haven't even done it, but they've known about it. And they hear these conversations. They're like, I've just forgotten, you know, I, I've forgotten about that. I, I really should go try it this next summer. And them yeah. trying it maybe implores them to, tr to get another friend to come try it with them. And we keep bringing more and more people into it. And yeah. man, and like, I've always thought, why, why aren't we going into schools and like having a, having an assembly where we have a couple hundred kids coming to gym and I'll and get up there and talk about, you know, the outdoors and how they can get involved. I feel like there's such a disconnect in schools with outdoor education. Definitely. That, man, it's just all focused on sports. It's all focused on, you know, the academic side, but then there's like no resources for kids to be able to get outdoors and do these things. Yeah. If there is, it's very little and it's not really enough to, get the whole majority to really think about it that way so yeah yeah and you know i think that's really interesting because if you like work with schools in that way to get it then um the people that would be helping facilitate it with you would be people from those communities you know because the school is like based in the local community and employs yes. people from the local community and so that's definitely very much uh uh for you know different different socioeconomic statuses and stuff like different neighborhoods you know going in there that's definitely a, a, a time you know a time piece um for you to like go in there teach whitewater kayaking is structured you know it could be like an after school activity or something like that and yeah. then you're working alongside people that the kids already feel comfortable with um and so that and so they're not just maybe completely intimidated by it or whatever it's like oh like you know maybe i will show up because coach whatever or you know or, or mr mrs whoever is like you know there as well so it's not yeah. just like a completely foreign thing so i think that's a pretty yeah that's a pretty cool idea and i think with any of this if uh we're just trying to create more diversity and stuff all it takes is just one person of color to be there be passionate about the sport um, and engage with other people of color, uh, you know, and then there's that immediate connection. I mean, it just yeah. takes, yeah, it just takes one person for like a group of kids or whatever to be like, well, they do it. And so like, I can do this too, you know, I, I think yeah. that, yeah, it, it means it, it, yeah, one person can change a lot or whatever, you know, just, so yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There, there's a big, there's a big piece of that that really does help kind of allow that entryway for um, just having the same race, you know, just being around your race and being comfortable with that and allowing black people to see you out there doing that. Like, oh, wow, there is, there is another black man out there doing kayaking. Maybe it, maybe I can give it a try. Um, right. You know, and, and that's saying the same thing for any other race as well outside of the white race that we see predominantly in the sport. Right. Um, and we've tried to we've tried to play into that with outdoor chat with finding people that are willing to do it, that are passionate about it, that are good proponents to the sport and that can lead by example and show that there's no reason to be super scared of this, that we're gonna lead you into it in a great way and give you the right instruction, the right peace of mind to know you're doing something that's safe. Yeah. And, and I, I will say also though, um, that outdoor Chattanooga specifically, I mean, just coming from the experience of when I was, you know, a member of the program and stuff before working there, uh, y'all always just made me feel so welcome and comfortable, you know, it is way more than just like a, uh, like just an instructor, like, you're teaching me how to do this and, and very rigid and stuff, you know, and yeah. you guys, yeah. When, when y'all, uh, 
go on trips, stuff like that. It's very much like you're welcoming these people into like this little outdoor Chattanooga community, you know? It's very comfortable feeling. It, it's very much feels like, um, like we're like this, this team, you know, rather than just like this like classroom or like lecture on the river. It's like, we're this team for the day that's going down this river and like, you know, working together, having a good time. It's, yeah, so I will say that once people, you know, if, if people are able to, uh, to, to get up the courage to kind of, you know, confront some of these very natural and very justified fears of getting in the outdoors, if they're not, you know, born and raised in it, um, then you guys do welcome, welcome with open arms and make, make anybody feel very comfortable from my experience. So That's I will say awesome. that. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It's glad I'm glad to hear that. And um, I felt the same even before I came really to work here full time with Zach Bob being the um, the coordinator back when I was first coming into the program and working, doing the yeah. job that you did. And like Zach and James, just so fun loving, humble yeah. guys. Didn't make you feel intimidated. Didn't make you feel belittled by any by any means. Mm -hmm. um, when you were getting into it, so it's really that's a big part of trying to make people feel safe you know, and make people feel comfortable with people they're around. And, and it is a team sport, even though it's an individual sport, it's a team sport. And, you know, that's, I think that's probably another misconception too, is that someone feels like, well, I'm all by myself. Like I'm in my kayak and I'm all by myself. No one's going to help me. If I flip over, the river's going to take me, you know, right. but that's not even close to the culture that we want to manifest for people getting into the sport through, through us especially, we want people to realize that we got your back and that this is how the community operates, you know, that we're going to be there for you, that we're going to, you know, give you that support that you need to start conquering these fears. Um, right. And speaking of conquering fears, I'm going to throw up my screen real quick and show this cool picture of Alden here running Baby Falls on the Tellicote River. Let's see if I can <laughs> up. Do you see my screen? Yeah, I see it. Yep. Okay. We gotta make this a little bigger here. We gotta make the big screen. There we go. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. So who's this goofball in the yellow helmet up there? Yeah, I know. I know. I think just the beater. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this beater happens to be James Eubank. He is <laughs> <laughs> he uh was on the trip i was on this trip with alden as well um it was me james james is a rapid learning instructor and then yep. here's alden coming over this nice 15 foot 20 foot waterfall and uh looking like he knows what he's doing getting ready to practice for his tuck and run an 80 foot waterfall is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe one day <laughs> Uh, describe that experience, man. Like, you know, coming up from other rivers that you had ran prior to this, running yeah. a waterfall this big, did that intimidate you when you were there? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For the, uh, yeah, for the first time. Um, I will say that with the Teleco specifically, uh, at this point, I had already ran the green. Yep. Pretty sure. I'd ran the Narrows, and I ran, uh, the name of the rap is escaping me, but that drop on the Chioa. Um, Bear Creek Falls. Yeah. Yep. And I'd already ran the left side of that drop, which is like a pretty straight waterfall. So I was familiar uh, with how to run drops like these. And so honestly, I was just concerned of uh, missing the lip, flipping over, flipping over in a weird way. Yeah. And because uh, you know that pool, like there is plenty of time to roll up, but it goes like right into another rapid. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, when I hit that, I was just so surprised with how nice that lip is you can kind of like see it like just shooting out like that just that mm -hmm. lip is i think it's so nice to to boof off of to get a good stroke and then you really just kind of land flat yeah so, yeah i wrap this one <laughs> good one man this is even you know all the rivers i've paddled this is one of my favorite rivers i I really built a lot of my skills and comfortability with drops and ledges off of this river. Um, mm -hmm. Now, how many, how many years of experience have you had up to when you paddled the Teleco? I think I'm kayaking for like three years at that point. Okay. And uh, 
Yeah. And then the first year being all on the Hiawassee. Yeah. And, and then paddling the Akoe with the Hiawassee and the Tukasiji. Rapid learning. Um, the, through the rapid learning program. And then at the end of my first year, Zach started kind of taking me out, uh, Zach and you to the Akoe and stuff. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So I think about three years at that point, but, uh, by, by the end of my second year, I was running class four. I'm pretty sure mm. if I remember correctly. Yeah. You, um, I mean, you have an athletic background, you're a pretty athletic guy. So you're kind of growth through the sport, maybe a little faster than some people's. And, um, you know, there's no like perfect formula for the progression of like, am I ready for this river for everybody? You know, it, it, it's different for everybody because not everybody learns at the same pace, but, um, you know, two or three years of building good class three, four experience and learning your boot stroke and being able to work the river will put you in the right place to be comfortable with the teleco when you come to it. This was something that you were already ready for. Probably are, you'd been ready for, for a while, but I uh, just hadn't had the opportunity maybe, but, um, yeah. you know, being able to work the Okoe River, if you're making a lot of moves on the Okoe, you're boofing all the little small ledges and holes, you've got all those skills, you're ready for the teleco. In my yeah, opinion. yeah. I, I cannot iterate enough how uh, how the Okoe, like that river, if you learn how to kayak, like the nooks and crannies of that river and stuff, I mean, mm. that can take you so far in whitewater kayaking. For sure. For sure. And if you do have the money, you know, shout out to Joe Gudger over there at Ace Kayak and he's doing a heck of a job. He's he's the one that knows the Okoe like every hair on his head. He <laughs> he knows it very, very well. So, you know, building off the Okoe for any river, no matter what level of kayaker you are, can make you just an exceptional kayaker. You're going to learn a lot from that river. No yeah. doubt about it. No doubt about it. Well, hey man, we have uh, we've had some fun conversation. We've probably been going a little longer than than what we're supposed to. Hopefully, people can listen to this conversation of us just being getting on tangents and getting stoked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Any uh, closing points that you want to leave out there for the audience, or anything you want to finish up with? Uh, just um, just if you're listening, and you know whether you're a person of color or not uh and you you have some fears about whitewater kayaking and getting into it um give it a shot it i promise you that one it's probably nothing like you think it will be yeah and, and uh and I, and I mean that in the most assuring pos positive way possible uh, give it a shot uh do it with people you trust um have a good team but but go for it, and I guarantee you, if you let it, it'll take you on a journey of a of a lifetime. 